Shalom, everybody. How are you? Welcome. We are uh, on a brand new week this week. This is uh, this is Yom Rishon. This is Sunday, and we're very excited to start. We're going to have a great show today. Do some really exciting things. And the first thing that I want to show you is: Do you see? I would like to start off the show with a little about where I live and what's behind me and what's in my neighborhood. And this week we're gonna do a lot of fun things just like that. But if you look all the way behind me, I'm gonna point right there. Do you see that there's a little red building? And do you see how there is like no other buildings here? None, right along here. On the top of the mountain there's nothing, but all the way in the distance, all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way, right there by my finger, there is a red building. Isn't that strange that there's just one red building? It looks like a little tiny red house. And that building has been there ever since I moved into my house, which looks every day when I look at it, I see that red building. So what is that red building? Do you have any guesses what that red building might be? It's a little difficult to try to figure it out from this far away, right? It's actually, because of our camera, it looks much further than it is. If I yelled a little, I could probably have a conversation with somebody at that red building. It's really not that far away. But what is that red building? Does anyone know? Well, Naomi thinks maybe it's the border. That's not the border. That's actually still in my town in Mitzvah Yericho. And it's a special, special building. It's not a house. Nobody lives in there. But every day, a couple people go inside. Does that give you a hint as to what it could be? A building that every day people go inside. I know what you're thinking. It's a big Knesset. It's a shul. Nope. It's not a big Knesset. It's not a shul. It's actually an office. And do you know what kind of an office it is? This is strange. It doesn't look like an office, right? Offices usually aren't red, and they're not usually tall, small, excuse me, or short, right? That's not what it is. It's an office where they sell houses in Eretz Yisrael, where I live, in Mitzvah Yericho. Do you want to see the houses that they sell? Look, if we just turn our camera a little bit, you'll see five brand new buildings. And if you want to live in them, well, you can't live in these anymore. These are all sold. But they're building more buildings. They're building new ones. And if you want to buy one of those houses, that's where you go. You go in our, well, we can't see it anymore. There it is. You go in our red little building and there's a person in there and they help you buy the house. And since you can buy it before it's even built, you get to see what kind of house you want. You could say you want the kitchen on the top or the kitchen on the bottom. Or the, it's a really interesting place. And in that red building, there's a man who sits in that red building. He's not there all the time. Sometimes people that work for him are there. But there's a man, and his name is Velvel. Velvel doesn't know we're talking about him, but he wouldn't mind because we're only going to say nice things because there's only nice things to say about Velvel. And Velvel builds buildings all over Eretz Yisrael. Everywhere you go, you see Velvel's buildings everywhere and Velvel's big machines that move lots of dirt. All the way in the back over there, Velvel actually took apart an entire mountain to build his houses on. He knows how to take a m machines and move whole mountains from one place to another. It's amazing. And every day we get to come outside and in the morning, very early, early in the morning, all the workers come, they stop by, they say, good morning, Velvel. And then they go to work, moving mountains and building houses. And it's like a whole show with all the cars you'd ever want to see and all the people you'd always, always want to see right outside. House. And that's what we have in Mitzvah Yericho because are growing like crazy here. They're building houses every single day. More and more houses and more and more fun people are moving in. Maybe you're one of the people watching who just moved in. But that's why we love living here in Mitzvah Yericho. So that's the first part of our show today. We'll tell you a little bit about our town and the little red building that seems 
but is really so important because it helps people buy their new homes. Like that. Okay, let's go on to something else today. Let's go on to a great story. I have an amazing story for you. Do you guys want to hear a great story? Let me try that one more time. Do you want to hear a great story? I think I might have heard you there. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story about somebody named Rav Ava and Rav Abba's tzedakah. Okay, his name is Rav Ava, and I know Abba means father, like dad, but his first name was Abba. There are people that their first name is Abba, and his first name was actually Abba. Probably got very confusing in his house when his kids wanted to call him something, and they would say, Abba. And that was his name, so they couldn't really say it. It's a good question what you do there. Maybe they just called him Dad. Okay, anyway, Abba didn't live in Eretz Yisrael when he was born. He moved here, like me, when he got older, and he didn't live here in, in Mitzpah Richo. He lived, if you would take the road and go that way. He lived in a place called Tiveria, which is up north. Tiveria is next to a big sea called the Kinneret. It's next to the Kinneret, and that's where he that's where he lived. He lived in Tiveria by the Kinneret. Okay. And what did Rav Ada, well, before I tell you what he did, let me tell you this. Rav Ada lived in Bavel. We talked about Bavel last week. Bavel is a place all the way, all the way, all the way over there, past Jordan, past Jordan's borders, all the way in a place today called Iraq. That's where he lived. And he wanted to move to Eretz Yisrael. And he went to his Rav and he asked his Rebbe, he said, Rebbe, do you think it's a good idea to move to Eretz Yisrael? And his Rebbe thought that he would do better in Bavel. But he decided to move anyway, and that's where he lived. He lived in Tiveria in Eretz Yisrael. So that's where he came. So that's how he got to Eretz Yisrael. Now, what did he do all day long? Obviously, he learned a lot of Torah, or else we wouldn't really be talking about him so much, because we like to talk about people that learned a lot, a lot of Torah and taught a lot of Torah. But do you know what else he did to be able to make money? He had a job, and he sold the most beautiful silk. I'm not sure if everybody watching knows what silk is, but if you've ever seen a man wear a tie, it's usually made out of silk. Or sometimes your mommy might have a, like a handkerchief. I don't really know what it's called, but and I'm gonna get made fun of for this. No one's gonna really make fun of me because making fun of people is, is not nice. But uh, it's going. It's sometimes your mommy wears something on her head or on her neck that's made out of silk, and silk is very, very smooth and it feels really nice. Sometimes people even have shirts made out of silk, and people love, love. They absolutely love silk. But do you know where silk comes from? This is funny. Do you know where silk comes from? Silk doesn't grow in the fields. It's not like when your shirt is made out of cotton, it grows in the field. Silk isn't made on a tree. You can't pick it. Silk is actually made from worm. That's pretty funny, right? Well, people would come from all over to buy Rav Abba's silk. They loved it. They would make their clothing out of his silk, and silk was very hard to find. So Rav Ada had something that everybody really, really wanted. He had silk, and people would go everywhere to get Rav Ada's silk. Now, we have a rule, a mitzvah, that we're very, very careful about. I'm sure all of you are very careful about it. I try to be very careful about it. And everybody that does mitzvot really tries to be careful about this. And what I'm talking about is not hurting other people's feelings. We really don't like to hurt other people's feelings. And Hashem said in the Torah that you're not allowed to hurt other people's feelings. And there was a rabbi that taught a lesson that's so important, but will never come true. 
He said, it's more important or it would be better to be burnt by fire than to embarrass somebody else. We don't want to ever, ever, ever embarrass somebody else. And a lot of times, it's very easy to embarrass somebody else. And sometimes we think, think, but we're wrong. It makes us feel better to embarrass somebody else, but it's really not. We really don't want to embarrass anybody. And sometimes we embarrass people by calling them a name that they don't like, right? We don't like that. And sometimes we embarrass people because when they do something that's, that's funny, they make a mistake, sometimes we laugh at them, but that embarrasses them. That's not nice. And sometimes we'll talk about Thing that they once did that made them feel bad and it makes them feel bad again talk about it and that embarrasses them and all those times we don't want to do that we never want to embarrass somebody embarrassing somebody is really bad in the Torah we never want to do it and if we ever do it by accident or we make a mistake and embarrass somebody we want to go to that person and say we're so sorry we didn't really want to embarrass you and we're sorry that we did because we know when somebody embarrasses us, it hurts our feelings. And we don't like that. We don't like it when our feelings are hurt. And if we don't like it, we should never do it to somebody else. Well, there's another thing that just like embarrassing somebody makes them feel bad. And when we embarrass somebody, really it makes us feel bad. There's something that can fix it. You know the fix? This is a great fix. This is something that makes us feel good and it makes us feel good. That's great. That's like a perfect combination. And you know what it is? Giving tzedakah. Giving tzedakah. Tzedakah in English is charity. It's when somebody else doesn't have, maybe doesn't have food, maybe doesn't have clothing, maybe they don't have enough money. We can give them some of our clothes or some of our money or some of our food, and that is tzedakah. Tzedakah is a big mitzvah, and it makes us feel so good. Usually, if we lose something, it makes us feel bad. But when we give it to somebody for tzedakah, even though we're losing it, it makes us feel great. That's why stucco is so good and so important. But watch this. When we give tzedaka, it's very easy to turn our mitzvah upside down into not a mitzvah anymore. What do you mean? How could we give stucco and not do a mitzvah and make a mistake? Because this is very important. So listen. Somebody that needs tzedakah is usually very sad. They're sad because they don't have and they feel very bad. And sometimes maybe you have a lot of shirts and maybe you have three or four shirts. Sometimes somebody with tzedakah only have one or two shirts. So when they come to school, or they go to the Bay Knesset, or they go in the street, and they're walking around, and they feel very bad because they don't have what everybody else has. So it's very important that when we do something, we make sure that we're making them feel good, not just giving them a shirt, but making them feel great about getting a shirt, or making them feel great that they're getting money. But if, let's say, we would never do this, but I saw it written somewhere in a sefer, in a gemara, in a book of mitzvot, that they said you have to be careful. Because sometimes they once saw somebody giving staka, and he took his coin, and he threw it at the poor person and said, here you go, here's your money, poor person. And the poor person was already feeling very And now... He felt even more sad because now he didn't even, he, 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 the person threw the money at him and he, he needed that money. So why did the person throw the money at him? 
So he wanted to feel better, and now he felt sad. And even though the person gave stucca, it made him feel not so good. Oh, we don't want to do that. So when we get stuck, we want to make the person feel great. So how do we do that? So listen to how, how Rav, Ada, uh, Rav Abba excuse me, used to give tzedakah. You ready? Listen to what he would do. Because he didn't want anybody to feel bad. He didn't even want to know who he was giving stucca to. So he took his beautiful silk. Remember, he used to sell silk. Okay, listen to this story. This is great. He used to take his beautiful silk. And he made a handkerchief. He took like a big piece of silk and he tied it together and put it on a stick behind him. And in the handkerchief, he used to put money. He used to put money inside the handkerchief. And then he would walk around with his stick like this. He would walk around with his, with his stick and the handkerchief and he would have money in the handkerchief and he would walk around the street, and if a poor person saw him, he knew, because everybody knew Rav Abba was a big tzaddik and he would give a lot of tzedakah, he knew he could just go up to the handkerchief and take money. Just take money out of the handkerchief, and Rav Abba would never know who was taking. And the poor person wasn't embarrassed, because Rav Abba wouldn't even know that he was poor. Isn't that incredible? They would just go, what a mitzvah. Now you'll say to me, hold on a second, Rabbi Pilchas. Wait a minute. Wait just one minute. How did Rav Abba know that thieves weren't coming and taking the money without permission? It wasn't for them. It was only supposed to be for poor people. So how... How did he know? Well, the Gemara says Rav Abba had a trick. He would close his eyes, but leave him open a crack, just enough to make it look like his eyes were open, but he couldn't really see anything. And every couple of minutes, he would turn around like this. So the thieves thought he could see, but he really couldn't see. So if there was a poor person there, the poor person could take money and nobody would know that he was a poor person. And nobody stole because of Rav Abba's eye trick. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that unbelievable? What a mitzvah. Rav Abba did a tremendous chesed. What a mitzvah that he did. That was, it's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely incredible. So, that was our story. That's how our Abba was such a side. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that you could do what Rav Abba used to do? That Rav Abba used to give tzedakah without anybody knowing? That would be very hard, but there is a way we could do it. And I'll tell you how. In our Beit Knesset, in our Shul, there is always a place where you can give tzedakah. And you don't know who the tzedakah is going to. And the ani, the poor person who's getting the money, won't know who he's getting it from. Or you could give it to the rabbi in your synagogue or in your school. And they can go ahead and give it, and you, they would have no idea. And that's exactly what Rabbi would do. Rabbi would make this beautiful silk, he would sell the silk, and then he would take the money, put it in the silk handkerchief, put it on the stick, put it behind him, and go around all day long. And all day long, people would be so happy because they could get money for what they needed, and they wouldn't feel bad. And that's what we need to do. We need to make people feel good. Now, let me just tell you a little trick, a little secret. If you do see a poor person and you're going to give him money, you should say to him, I hope that very, very soon you're going to do great because I know you will. And that'll make him feel so much better. Those are the ways that we make people feel good. We tell them that they're great people. And that's what Abba taught us. Now, I want to show you something. 
that's the end of our story. I want to show you something. Every day I like to show you something. Do you remember last week I showed you my watch? I'm still wearing it, right? Well, today I'm going to show you something else. Do you want to see something special? This is something we should all have in our houses. And I bet everybody watching has this in their house. Everybody. I'm sure of it. I'm sure everybody has it. Do you know that ever since Har Sinai, 3,000 years ago, there has never been a Jewish town without one of these? Do you th what do you think it is? Couldn't hear you. Did you say it again? Couldn't hear you. One more time. You couldn't. No. Okay. Well, let me show you what it is. You ready? Here we go. I'm bringing it up. It's coming up. Here it is. Slowly, slowly, slowly. This is a stucca box. Do you see? Now, it's a special box. In Hebrew, it's called Kupat Staka. It's a special box, and it has a little slit on the top. And what you do is, you can keep this in your house, and whenever you have money that you want to give to Staka, you can put it in this box. I'm going to show you how to do it right here. You ready? Here's my coin. This is 10 agarot. I'm going to take my 10 agarot coin. Do you want to see? It even has, because we're in Israel, it has a menorah on it. Do you see? And on the other side, it says 10. Okay? And I'm going to take my 10 agarot coin, and I'm going to put it in here. And when I do, I will be doing the mitzvah of tzedakah. You right? What? It, here we go. Here it is. You ready? Oh, okay. Now, wait a minute, you'll say. Hold on a second. How did that work? That wasn't a mitzvah. Now it's just in the box, and the box is still in your hand. That didn't go to an ani. Well, let me show you how this box works. It's not magic, but it's just as great. After this box gets full, on the bottom of the box is a piece that stays in. Okay? And you can take the piece out, and all the money comes out. And then we put the money in a bag. And if we know a poor person, we can give them the money ourselves. And if we don't know the poor person, then we can give it to our rabbi or we can give it to our, our principal or our teacher or our mora or our mora or our rav or our rebbe or whoever you know that might, need, not, that might know an ani and you can give it to them. So when I put the coin in, like we did before, it's already a mitzvah because I know that one day it's going to end up in with a poor person's hand and it's going to help them out. And you could even give it to your school to help them, let's say, help somebody who can't pay to go to the school or somebody who can't pay for lunch, it can help them or somebody who doesn't have enough clothes, they can help them. And Staka goes to a lot of different places. And just giving the money to Staka, taking it out of your pocket and giving it to somebody else or just putting it aside, that's a really, really big mitzvah. So everybody should have a Tzedakah box in their house. And you know what? If you don't have a stucker box in your house and you really want one, you can send me a message on this Facebook and I'll make sure you get a stucker box in your house. I'll make sure of it. But I'm pretty sure everybody watching probably has a stucker box in their house. I like this stucker box because it has wood and it looks silv like silver and it looks like it's shining. And I got this as a gift for my wedding which was a long time ago, but I still use this stucca box and I keep it right by my desk. Now, I have another surprise for you. Do you want to see, do you want to see another surprise? Here, remember every time on the show, I show you one of my children. Well, today I have another one of my children to show you. <clears throat> He's my baby, but I don't hold him in my arms anymore because he's not a baby anymore. I just call him my baby because he's my youngest. This is my son, Moshe. Say hello, Moshe. Hi. See, this is my son, Moshe. Moshe isn't nine years old, 
He's not 13 years old. He's not 12 years old. And he's not 10 years old. He's 11 years old. 11 years old. He's in Kita Hay in fifth grade. He in Mitzpah Yericho. There's a beautiful, amazing school. And he has an amazing Rav. And Moshe has a question because every day his Rav, his teacher, sends him a whole list of things that he has to do, right? You have to dive in, in the first, right? And then he's got to read a lot. And then he's got to learn a lot. And he's got to do math. And he's got all these things that he has to do every day. And Moshe has a question. Go ahead, Moshe. Um, when someone sends you homework, do you have to do it? Did you hear that? When his rub sends him homework, does he have to do it? Because Moshe, probably like you, doesn't go to school anymore. Because his school is closed, probably like your school is closed. And when Moshe heard his school was getting closed, Moshe was very excited. He said, whoa, no more school, that means no more homework. But then his rub sent him a message and said, no, nah, that's not how it works. We're going to send you work at home. And Moshe was not so happy about that. But now Moshe and I get up very early in the morning. This morning we were up at 6 in the morning. And then we davened, just like his rob said. And then first we got dressed. Then we davened. And then we sat down and did Moshe's homework together. And Moshe was what we call in Israel a yele to Yerushalayim. He was a perfect boy who did his homework so well. But Moshe wants to know, does he have to do his homework? Because we don't go to school anymore. And Moshe, I have a good answer for you, which you might not like, but it's a great answer. And the answer is yes. You oh. have to do your homework because homework might not seem as exciting as when Moshe plays soccer or golf with me or if we go out on a, on a walk up to that mountain like we do every day. But it still makes you into a better person because you're learning new things. You're learning important skills like math and you're learning how to read better when you read your stories and you're learning lots of Torah together. And that is why homework is so important. So Moshe, the answer is yes. You don't have to do your homework. You get to do your homework every day uh, like that. Well, guys, that's the end of our show for today. Moshe, thank you for coming today. You're welcome. Well, see, that was very polite. And we learned about stuck and we learned about odd great things. And tomorrow, we're going to be on at the same exact time. So I hope you'll come and I hope you'll tell your friends about the show. Have a great day, everybody. Shalom.